1933, a Hungarian physicist named Leo Zillard, who had escaped Jewish oppression in Budapest, was standing on a corner waiting for a light to change here in Bloomsbury, right where Russell Square crosses Southampton Road. And it suddenly occurred to him, as the light changed, that mankind might be capable of creating a nuclear chain reaction that would release enough energy to create an atomic blast. According to Zillard's biography, time cracked open and he saw the death of the world and all its woes in the shape of things to come. I don't know what the hell he was looking at in 1933 that made him think that, but nonetheless, six years later, in 1939, he co-authored a letter with the physicists Edward Teller and Eugene Wigner and sent it to Albert Einstein. Einstein signed it and delivered it to President Franklin D. Roosevelt. The letter warned that Germany might be developing an atomic bomb and suggested that the United States should start its own atomic program. Roosevelt read it, and a few years later, the Manhattan Project was born. America was in the nuke business. From 1945 until 1991, the Cold War infused itself into our consciousness in incredibly subtle and incredibly brutal ways. The Army needs tanks, Mr. Sylvester. Oh, sure. I'd like to hear you tell it to some of my dealers. If your dealers are good Americans, they'll know that tanks are more important than tractors. You have to ask yourself, in a war with no casualties, how do you know when you're winning? Through cultural victories. Throughout the Cold War, technology, science, sports, arts, architecture, films, books, even chess, were orchestrated as showdowns between the U.S. and the Soviets in an effort to humiliate, embarrass, and discredit each other. It is a contest unlike any we have ever faced in our history as a nation. It is total competition with an antagonist who is putting into it everything within his capability. Give him a black eye, win a moral victory, and hope it takes the pressure off those red-hot nuclear buttons. But given the nature of basic human ineptitude, one question stands out. How in the wide, wide world of sports did we not blow ourselves up? Mountains into New it's been hailed as one of the greatest achievements of modern history, a project that combined the talents of Americans, Brits, Germans, Canadians, even Ukrainians. Its creation would highlight the madness of the era and, once viewed, would go on to cause hysteria and panic. It involved formidable technical prowess and no one involved in the project had the slightest idea if it would work or not. I'm talking, of course, about Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> the film that presages the trauma of the modern nuclear age. Often cited as one of the greatest comedy films ever, but that was purely accidental. It looks like we're in a shooting war. The hell. All the Russians involved, sir. Range one mile. When Stanley Kubrick began writing the script in 1962, he intended to make a serious film about mankind's inherent fear of nuclear annihilation. But he came across so many absurdities and paradoxes in the concept of engineered human destruction, eventually he had no choice but to make it a black comedy. I first became aware of it, Mandrake, during the physical act of love. Huh. People generally forget that the film had a subtitle. How I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb which was a pretty audacious suggestion at the time because we were pretty damn worried. I don't like the look of this, friend. Has that plane really got a chance of getting through? The Cuban Missile Crisis had brought the U.S. and Russia to the brink of nuclear war. Folks were a little on edge. I was under the impression that I was the only one in authority to order the use of nuclear weapons. The film was supposed to end with a gigantic pie fight. 
But Kubrick cut that scene because I guess he figured Americans weren't exactly in a slap-happy mood. I went to see the film when I was nine years old with my dad, and we laughed our butts off. But the ride home was pretty quiet because we both realized we just watched a film about the world blowing up and couldn't quite figure out why that was so hilarious. Well, boys, I reckon this is it. Nuclear combat toe-to-toe with the Ruskies. together when we go obviously i couldn't fathom that at the age of nine but now being the seasoned astute comedian that i am it's obvious strange love tapped into our darkest fears america and russia had reached a stage where they could destroy each other a hundred times over it was like two paralyzed guys stockpiling wheelchairs to prove some kind of pointless superiority it was a delusional war that only cared about the interplay of men and their machines Strange love forced us to confront that dehumanization. The only response was to laugh. When the air becomes uranus, we will all go simultaneous. Yes, we all will go together when we go. The film was scheduled to be test screened on November 22nd, 1963, the same day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. So the film's release was pushed back to January 1964, and in that very same month, Kennedy's Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, introduced a brand new national nuclear strategy. It called for retaliating to any preemptive Russian strike by specifically wiping out 150 of Russia's cities, 30% of its population, and 50% of its industrial capacity. Anything more than that, McNamara concluded, would be overkill. Apparently the idea was this. If the Soviets understood that they had some capability to respond, they wouldn't feel the need to attack us in the first place. Which is like saying to someone about to mug you, well, you're gonna mug me? No, 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 I am going to mug you. But when I mug you, I will leave you with just enough money not to feel the need to mug me in the first place. Colloquially, this idea became known as mutually assured destruction, or MAD. Atomic power, atomic power, was given by the mighty hand of God. Atomic power, atomic power, it was given by the mighty hand of God. The minute the uranium-235 atom was split, In 1939, by the two German physicists Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann, essentially a new religion was born, subatomic physics. All the tenets were there, a staggering cosmic force capable of, of benevolence or destruction, heaven versus hell, good versus evil, and its disciples were the engineers and the scientists who just had to tinker, even when they knew they were playing dice with humanity. So, in 1942, the U.S. Army rounded up a group of these scientists and set up the Manhattan Project, and set about working on the destruction of mankind. Even during the Manhattan Project, Oppenheimer, Edward Teller, and the scientists were caught up in trying to figure out how to make this work. They were so intent on trying to do their job, to discover you know, how, to, how to make it all happen. And, and successfully produced the atomic bomb. They were not asked, what do you think about how we should use this? Now, American history, whenever it's asked to justify dropping fat man and little boy on Japan, likes to whip open its lapel and show you its patriotism badge. Oh, well, you know, the Germans were working on it first. Yeah, yeah. The Japanese, they were gonna fight to the death. Okay, that explains why the bomb got used. It doesn't explain why the bomb was built. And the reason the bomb was built was because physicists, saturated with limitless resources, got drunk on their discovery. Blinded by science, high on their own product, they couldn't help themselves. You better stop them scientists from researching, because they done gone too far. At Los Alamos, it wasn't like, ooh, should we build the very malevolent weapon? Well, that wasn't the question. Oppenheimer said, This bomb project, you know, as much as we abhor building huge weapons, is necessary. It's the only way we could end this war 
and possibly all future world wars. The men and the women of the Manhattan Project obviously knew they were working on a mathematical model for the end of the world, something so malevolent they couldn't even call it a bomb. They called it a gadget, you know, like a fidget spinner. They were both repulsed and seduced by the power of the bomb. There's a word for that, numinous. Not luminous, numinous. The beam from a laser pen is luminous. What that beam does to a cat is numinous. Stay with me, folks. Remember those school science projects where some kid lined a table with ping pong balls and mouse traps to set off a chain reaction? Well, America's atomic program was full of those kinds of kids. They were constantly searching for a way to get more bang for the buck from a plutonium core. They were curious, they were reckless, and that was a deadly combination. Three plutonium cores were developed for World War II. One was detonated at Trinity, one at Nagasaki, and the third was never employed. It sat at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, and even though it was guarded and secured, it still managed to kill people. On August 21st, 1945, a 24-year-old scientist named Harry Daglian Jr. decided, for some crazy reason, to conduct criticality tests on the core at 9.30 p.m. Daglian started rearranging these tungsten carbide bricks into various formations, like Jenga blocks, to test the core's criticality. This was known as tickling the dragon's tail. Well, old Daglian dropped one of the bricks right onto the core. There was a blue flash of light, a mule kick of heat, and 25 days later, Daglian was dead from radiation sickness. The core was removed to a new site to keep it safer. And less than a year later, the physicist Louis Slotin was showing the thing off to his buddies. The core sat between two beryllium spheres with spacers to keep it from making a seal, which would have caused it to become super critical. Slotin removed the spacers and crazy cowboy took the screwdriver and started jacking the spheres up and down just so his buddies could hear the metronomic changes to the Geiger counter. When he reached the approximate tempo of Girl from Ipanema, suddenly the screwdriver slipped out, spheres touched together, blue light, mule kick, Slotin said, well, that does it, and nine days later he was dead. The device became known as the Demon Core, and Slotin and Daglian became accidental heroes of the nuclear age. mentioned the Manhattan Project today, and uh, most people will probably think, oh, that's that a cappella group that sings Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy. But the scientists of Los Alamos, with their Genesis complex, had created a new god. And like anyone's god, very few people truly comprehend it. 2,000 physicists in America truly understood the fissioned atom. And between 1941 and 1946, the United States Censorship Office imposed a moratorium on dissemination of information about atomic research. So terms like atomic power, atomic fusion, cyclotrons, betatrons were forbidden to be mentioned in the press. Nobody wanted to tip off the Germans that America was working on this. Consequently, the job of explaining atomic power was left to pulp science magazines, and let's just say they got a bit breathless. Planes will be powered by a puff of atomic dust. A fistful of atomic snow will light up Baltimore for a year. Here's a prediction from Collier's Magazine, July 1940. A uranium power plant the size of a typewriter will allow automobiles to run for five million miles. Boy, were they off. Not only are there no five million mile automobiles, there's not even any typewriters anymore. Basically, it was unbridled optimism. Atomic energy was going to feed us and fuel us and warm us, and everything was going to be spectacular. Yeah, she heats my room, she lights my light, she starts my motor, and it runs all night, and she's my time to 
Now, contrary to what it wants the world to think, that America grew up consuming F. Scott Fitzgerald or Hemingway or Twain, the average American in the 40s possessed the literary capacity to absorb roughly one to three comic books a week. In 1942, the year they entered the war, Americans purchased more than a billion of them. One third of all the reading material shipped to troops in Europe and Japan during World War II were comic books. So, in a well-intentioned attempt to explain nuclear fission to a public that struggled to comprehend any text not contained in a floating word bubble, King Features Syndicate, the nation's largest publisher of cartoons, shrank America's most beloved cartoon couple, Dagwood and Blondie, to the size of atoms, sent them on an illustrated white-knuckle ride through the fission process, while various other cartoon heavyweights cheered them on. The foreword to this incredibly dense tome was written by General Leslie Groves, the project chief of the Manhattan Project. That's right, the man who was secretly shepherding the most brilliant minds of the 20th century. Oppenheimer, Fermi, Teller, Bohr appeared on a comic paperback, urging the average American reader to try and stay on intellectual par with Popeye. And these you are the moon. The sinister side? The idea that atomic energy could be weaponized existed solely in the realm of superhero adventures. I've been to Nagasaki, Hiroshima too. The same I did to them, baby, I can do to you. Cause I'm a Gucci, I'm a mama, and I'm just about to blow my top. Atomic Man was the alter ego of mild-mannered scholar Adam Mann, who accidentally drinks a glass of heavy water containing U-235 crystals then accidentally stumbles into a high-voltage generator. Hey, it could happen. Well, wouldn't you know it, suddenly he's a human atom bomb with all the power concentrated in his right hand, which unfortunately leaks, so he has to wear a lead glove. The atomic thunderbolt hit the newsstands in 1946. In real life, William Burns is a shell-shocked XGI who's lured into the lab of a fiendish scientist who accidentally pulls the wrong lever and radioactivates Burns, turns him into a multi-hued man-hunk of concentrated lightning. I'll blow your head off, baby, with nitroglycerine. Readers lapped it up. Pretty soon, every hero was battling atomic extortionists, Hawkman, The Flash, Captain Marvel, even Superman. In 1946, Action Comics Volume 101, Superman swallows a drug that makes him temporarily insane, then accidentally flies into an atomic test blast, which miraculously clears his head. So do you see the pattern here? At the core of every one of these stories is a nuclear accident victim battling a nuclear armed tyrant. Who's the winner there? No one. In the real world, if Peter Parker had been dumb enough to get himself bitten by a radioactive spider, yeah, sure, his debut would have been spectacular, but by issue two, he would have been hairless and undergoing cobalt treatments. And nobody wants to see that. So illustrators rewarded bumbling human ineptitude with superhuman powers. Sure, they were dime comics, but at the crux of these pulp illustrations was the central paradox of splitting an atom. Bad versus good, immortality versus extinction, energy versus ethics. And it's been that way ever since. There's never been a time in my life when Russia wasn't an existential threat to America. On June 14, 1954, I was only four days old, remember it like it was yesterday, the Civil Defense Authority conducted a hugely theatrical experiment with no grounding in reality called Operation Alert. In the cities, police and civil defense teams clear the streets. Meanwhile, from the Pentagon and other key points, top defense figures are airlifted to secret control centers from where they would direct America's defense and counterattack. It was estimated over four million would have died in New York City. No estimates were given for the rest of the country. But the grim arithmetic took on new impact for all who took part in Operation 
alert. Eisenhower pronounced the experiment an incredible success, and several months later, the Civil Defense Authority issued its findings. In the event of a Russian nuclear attack out of 165 million people, only 8.2 million would be vaporized. Another 6.6 .6 million wounded. What a relief. Maybe you're thinking, what did you care, Rich? You weren't even one. Why, the only evacuation you were concerned with was in your diapers. <laughs> yes, maybe that's true. But as you can see from this photo, even at the age of zero, I had an acute geopolitical awareness. <laughs> Throughout my formative years, I could never quite figure out what all this communist fuss was about. All I know is my country seemed to have some kind of noisy paranoia about iron curtains and hammers and sickles. That there was some evil force out there and it was red and vaguely metallic. My elementary school presented us with a fairly complex academic discussion of the communist doctrine. Before signing up, you boys ought to try a little taste of doctorism's formula to see what you'd get in exchange for your freedom. Go ahead, try it. You can't do this to me! I'll strike! The state forbids strikes. We must fight to regain our freedom, or everything is lost. Everything! Everything is fine. 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 The thrust of all this seemed pretty simple to me as a kid. The Soviets wanted to take away all of our stuff. Nothing could have been further from the truth. The USSR didn't want our stuff. They were waiting for us to get tired of owning our stuff and start spreading it around to the weak and the pitiable. At the end of World War II, three countries had emerged as winners, to varying degrees. If the object of war is to expand influence and to win real estate, Britain hadn't gained a thing. Its real estate had just been moved around a lot. America was the same size, but substantially swollen with pride and hubris. But Russia, owing to a Nazi non-aggression pact, had actually expanded. It now owned Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Eastern Poland, a Baltic beer gut that patted itself against perceived Western hostility. Here is target number one for the Reds. And who's in the bullseye? You are. Russia's leader, Stalin, self-preservationist, demagogue, ideologist, definitely in that order, was determined to expand the communist manifesto. Behind that scrawny mustache was a man consumed with narcissism, paranoia, and absolute power. He instilled in his people equal amounts of fear and worship. You know, he was numinous. After the Second World War, Stalin, and indeed everyone in the Soviet Union, uh, believed that it would have to develop its own atomic weapons uh, if it was going to rival the United States in world politics and in military terms. But ordinary Soviet citizens were paying a price for this nuclear arms race. For the overwhelming majority of Russians at that time, life was pretty tough because salaries were uh, pretty low, uh, they had to live like five, sometimes more of six families in one apartment. Uh, and even if you have to buy some basic necessities and you go to a supermarket, almost nothing. And if you see something, then you have to stay in line sometime, you know, for hour to buy just absolutely necessary things. At the same time, Soviet people knew that government spends tons of money on the military and to help uh, to promote this communist movement around the world. After Stalin's death, Khrushchev and the other successors agreed that they couldn't go on ruling the country by means of indiscriminate terror. So there was a more variegated and somewhat freer cultural and economic life 
uh, after about the mid-1950s. The hand of Soviet friendship has been reaching into every part of the world which shows the slightest inclination to receive it. When Khrushchev came to power, um, he started building uh, those um, huge complexes, and that's why they got the name Khrushchev. They were small, small, teeny places, but at least they were private. They sat around the kitchen tables where there would be filthy vodka or tea or Cuban rum or maybe an old onion growing out of a mayonnaise jar. They'd jam a pencil into the rotary dial of the phone to keep it off the hook so no one could listen in, and then they'd bitch and moan about the government. They'd crack jokes. They'd get hammered. They would wax fancifully about a future they didn't quite believe in. And if they lived in the country, they'd cluster around those same kitchen tables at night and just yammer, yammer, yammer about who was getting favors and who wasn't, or about books, plays, culture, poetry, trying to make some kind of romance out of their stifled suffering and eternal sacrifice. In the morning, the adults got up and went to work with their little tiny communist hammers. The kids went to school or straight to a young pioneers or Komsomol meeting. Everything was done for the communal good of motherland Russia. The idea of taking over America never remotely entered their minds. They were too damn exhausted. Many people criticized the Soviet Union, but there were a few good things too. One was free education, totally free education, a free medical service and job security. In the Soviet Union, you couldn't be unemployed. You couldn't be unemployed. Of course, your salary couldn't be not, not as good, but at least you should get a job. The classless society that the Soviets were constantly striving for evolved from very distinct classes. At the bottom rung were the gulag prisoners. Although Russians didn't use the word gulag, that was popularized by Solzhenitsyn in the 70s. They called them camps. And you could end up in camp for being too intelligent or for being dumb enough to crack the wrong joke to the wrong person. The camps were the source for all of the Soviets' raw materials, copper, nickel, timber, coal, the uranium for the atomic bomb, all extracted by slave prisoners. Karl Marx once said, all value is created by labor. Well, you don't get much more of a bargain than this, do you? We Russians didn't visualize owning things. They visualized making things. They'd taken the errant ramblings of an 1850s fantasist and hooked it up to a turbine. Steam-driven Marxism. Every year of the 1950s decade, Russian manufacturing and agriculture increased by at least 8%. It was on course to catch up with America's economy by 1960. To us, the USSR was uh, forced labor camps informants, a godless place where you could be arrested or executed just for owning a Bible. Fair enough. But how did the USSR become America's designated nemesis? How did the Cold War begin? Well, the short answer is spies. Now look here, Joe, quit acting smart. Stop being that old brazen sword. Stalin didn't have the physicist to build a bomb because, unfortunately, he'd shot most of them. He needed plans, informants, and so he established an espionage network. Oh, no, Joe. That's the elevator pitch. However, you can just as easily argue that the Cold War began with a screaming baby. Now, hear me out, because this is a story that if you pitched as a sitcom, the producers would go, I, I, I don't think so. No. Oh, no, no, I'm just weeding out some of the old stuff. I'll be here for a couple more On September 5th, 1945, only three days after the official end of World War II, a young Russian cipher clerk named Igor Gazinko sneaked out of the Russian embassy in Ottawa, Canada with more than 100 Soviet documents stuffed under his shirt. The documents contained evidence of a secret Soviet spy ring stretching from Canada to the U.S. to the U.K. 
Now, Russian embassy workers were forbidden to leave the compound, but old Gazinko was an exception because he and his wife had a screaming, obnoxious baby who never shut up. And the embassy chief's wife demanded that he be moved out. They gave him his own apartment, which was basically an open invitation to defect. And that is exactly what Gazinko decided to do. That night, Gazinko went to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and told him about the spy ring. They told him to tell his story walking. So he went to the Ottawa Journal. The night editor told him to get lost. He went to the Justice Department, but the Justice Department was closed. So he went back home and hid himself and his family in the apartment next door. Later that night, he peered through the keyhole and saw Soviet agents breaking into his apartment looking for him. The following morning, he went back to the RCMP and they agreed to examine the documents. Next thing you know, he was whisked off to a secret war camp outside Ottawa, where he was interviewed by both the MI5 and the FBI. The MI5 then informed the Prime Minister of Canada, Mackenzie King, that there was a spy ring operating in his country. Now King, who most Canadians would agree was a little bit of a whack job, grabbed the next train to DC to relay the story to President Truman. Truman may or may not have believed him due to the fact that King was commonly known to consult with spirit mediums. Mackenzie King went back to Canada and decided to sit on the story, as did Truman and the new British Prime Minister, Clement Attlee. In the uncertain post-war atmosphere, no one wanted to rattle diplomatic relations with Moscow. No one, that is, except the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover clearly didn't care about any cozy relationship between Canada, the U.S., and the Soviets. Now, Hoover wasn't just the head of the FBI. He was the FBI. Oh, he had his fingers in everything. And in early February 1946, he got wind of the story and immediately called Drew Pearson, a grubby, muck-raking NBC correspondent who would look right at home on any modern-day Fox News show. Pearson broke the story on television that night, and it was shit. Meet Fan. The subsequent investigation led to 39 arrests. Among them, Fred Rose, the leader of the Communist Party of Canada. In the United Kingdom, nuclear physicist Alan Nunn May and Klaus Fuchs were convicted and imprisoned. And in America, the investigation eventually resulted in the 1953 executions of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, the only Americans ever sentenced to death for espionage. As for Gazinko, he went into hiding occasionally surfacing on Canadian news reports and panel game shows to warn of the ever-present red threat lurking at the horizon of democracy. Words that might have borne more gravity had he not been wearing a laundry bag on his head. And that is how the world stumbled into the Cold War. Now, would things be different were it not for that screaming baby that allowed Gazinko to defect? Probably not but the confirmed presence of spies was all that bullet-headed neocons needed to ignite a domestic red scare. The FBI, big business, the Catholic Church, and Republicans desperate to get back into office banded together to convince ordinary Americans they were under attack, and in horror movie parlance, the calls were coming from inside the house. Communist infiltration became the central theme of the 1946 congressional elections, and nervous Americans voted the Republicans back into office in both the House and the Senate. We know the red we want is the red we've got in the old red, white, and blue. It's the red Men like J. Edgar Hoover and Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin were profoundly adept at conflating the Red Scare. They created a through line that made socialism indistinguishable from communism and communism indistinguishable from brainwashing. The red we've got in the old red, white, and blue. McCarthy comes on the scene and he's somebody who really picks up on the fact that the way to political success is to exploit these fears, and then the medium by which he's going to uh, do it is this uh, marvelous new electronic medium introduced into the home, uh, television. Many people have been waiting for someone to expose the extent to which our suicidal foreign policy has been dictated from the Kremlin. 
You know, with the Cold War, I always think of two words. Uh, one is affluence and the other is anxiety. Things are better than they have ever been before in America for more people. But at the same time, this generation always has the sense that it can be taken away in a heartbeat with an invasion by the Soviet Union, an attack by the Soviet Union, nuclear war, hydrogen bombs. So the Soviet Union becomes the focus of all those anxieties in the post-war era. Relax and take it easy. McCarthy is so universally associated with the Red Scare that we generally tend to lump every aspect of 50s communist hysteria under one term, McCarthyism. Even though McCarthyism both predates and postdates Joe McCarthy, the word itself now conjures this sort of peculiar sense of paranoia that American culture in the 1950s has about the menace of communism. Don't be nervous. With most of the so-called red baiting show trials of 50s America, the House Un-American Activities Committee, the Hollywood blacklisting of artists, the Rosenberg trial, had nothing to do with McCarthy. For all the self-flagellation and hand-wringing, the Red Scare did not ruin nearly as many lives as we like to believe. Yeah, sure, some actors and directors were barred from working for a while. It may all turn out to be just a dream. Out of two million government employees, a total of 560 were dismissed or denied government jobs based on some sort of communist affiliation. In fact, the argument could be made that McCarthyism was actually a tiny step forward for race relations in America because it didn't exclude anyone based on ethnicity or color or religion. It accepted you as a true-blooded American, regardless of ancestry, based on one single criteria, a gut-bucket hatred of communism. Stop! Will you tell these fools I'm not crazy? Make them listen to me before it's too late! Listen to me. Please listen. If you don't, if you won't, if you fail to understand, then the same incredible terror that's menacing me will strike at you! The 1956 film Invasion of the Body Snatchers is often seen as a cinematic allegory for the Red Scare, even though it never really mentions Russians or communism. It's about the residents of a small town called Santa Mira, California, who start undergoing very subtle behavioral changes. Their emotions and their personalities start to disappear. Suddenly, while you're asleep, they'll absorb your minds, your memories. I don't want any part of it. You're forgetting something, Miles. What's that? You have no choice. The director of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Don Siegel, never once said the film was an allegory for communism. He was just trying to make a halfway decent horror film. But many viewers chose to see it as a cautionary tale about the corruption of freedom and choice through the subtle subversion of reality. In other words, if we go to sleep, if we don't maintain eternal vigilance, they'll come and snatch our bodies. Can't you see? Everyone! They're here already! You're next! The meteoric rise in ownership of TVs in America happened at the same time as the Cold War. Thus, the hysteria of the Cold War and the Red Scare was magnified wholesale by television. Millions of Americans watched a man commit career suicide babbling on and on about brainwashing without realizing that if anything was brainwashing them, it was... TV's ability to blur the distinctions between our interior lives and the outside world, between subjects and objects, gave it the power to decide what was normal and decent in red, white, and blue, and play it back to us. It was the ultimate body snatcher. Ooh. It mutated the American public from interdirected individuals to a coagulated herd of impressionable bovines. You can spend all day watching sanitized versions of the American Dream, and then at 6 p.m., John Cameron Swayze would come on to remind you what a scary, screwed-up place the world really was. Out in Korea today, in the eastern part, 
33 superfortresses in the first big daylight raid in 11 months dropped 300 tons of bombs on a big communist military center. And meanwhile... And then we'd go back to watching... America's favorite family comedy, The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. Consequently, Americans confronted the nuclear threat with an incredibly strange mix of paranoia and pragmatism. A cartoon turtle named Bert would crawl out and inform us that all we had to do to survive a nuclear attack was hide under a desk. Presumably, a quarter inch of cheap plywood would protect us from this. The government tried to assure us that nuclear war wasn't really all that bad. The Civil Defense Department issued a pamphlet entitled Survival Under Atomic Attack with some very nifty tips on how to deal with that pesky fallout. Don't track radiation into the house with your feet because mom's going to be very upset with whoever dragged plutonium onto her brand new carpet. If caught outside during a nuclear flash, cover your face with your hands. You know, this should increase your chances of an open casket funeral. And here's my favorite, don't start rumors. In the chaos that follows a nuclear bombing, one rumor could create panic. Like someone's gonna stagger out of a nuclear fog with their skin dripping off and go, hey, I hear Rock Hudson's gay. Yeah, now you got a problem. I might dig myself a hole, move my baby down in the ground. Well, folks, I'm glad you could come down to see my fallout shelter. Just finished painting it last night. Looks like a nice job, Wall. This was the ever-changing optic of the Cold War. First, the Soviets wanted to take all our stuff. Then they wanted to blow us out of existence. What would be the point of that? I don't know, maybe nuking America was the quickest way to achieve the social equalization that communism was always banging on about. If we should ever have a nuclear war, we could get a heavy fallout even though we were not anywhere near the target area. Come on in, see the inside. Drive us all to live underground like prairie dogs? Can't get much more proletarian than that. But the Soviets underestimated the resilience of good old American material one-upmanship. Hey, isn't this nice? Well, Sir Ruth and I certainly can live in here very comfortably for at least two weeks. This elevator leads to an actual nuclear fallout shelter built in Las Vegas, Nevada. You see, even in a scenario where Americans were reduced to more locks, they were going to still show the world that the right to own a property you could lord over your neighbors is a God-given red, white, and blue entitlement. Hey, Walt, how's the wife and family, huh? Still living in that cheap tin can underground culvert you knocked out for your loved ones? You should come visit more often. Very eclectic. Tiffany. Louis Cactors. Hey, what are you using for furniture, Walt? Cable spools? Milk crates? Excuse me while I slip into something more comfortable. Show you the entertainment area. How long did it take you to build your shelter? Not so long. Oh, I spent a few evenings and a couple of weekends. Tell you what, Walt, you should bring the family over for a barbecue. Good old-fashioned cookout. You know, you can't live on condensed milk and pork and beans forever. Look at this. 
<laughs> Where's the beef? That was a there was an advert in the 70s that no one remembers because they were all dead. Well, I'm going to preach all a sermon about old man Adam, and I don't mean the Adam in the Bible, Adam. No, I don't mean the Adam that Mother Eve made it. I mean the thing that science liberated. By the mid-1950s, America's visceral fear of the Reds had shifted from internal to external. Everyone knew it was just a matter of time before the USSR had missiles capable of reaching us. I say the The development of these ballistic missiles was led by the Soviet Union. They wanted the capability of hitting targets faster and at greater distances. And that threat would be realized with the launch of Sputnik in 1957 and the ICBM that propelled it. But that same year, a different kind of weapon arrived from Russia, the novel Dr. Zhivago. In September 1958, a Dutch Secret Service agent named Juke van der Wilder delivered a wrapped brown paper parcel into the lap of the CIA in Washington, D.C. He thought they might be interested. Inside was a manuscript for Dr. Zhivago, written by Boris Pasternak, one of Russia's most revered poets. The book was never going to be published in the USSR because at its core, it was critical of the Soviet ethic. The CIA is an intelligence service. They viewed the book as a political weapon, and they wanted to use it as a political weapon to embarrass the Soviet Union. And it was part of a larger and ultimately growing um, part of the CIA's cultural Cold War with the Soviet Union. This was one of the first operations into something that grew exponentially over the years and continued until the collapse of the Soviet Union. The CIA saw in the book a humanistic message, quote, that every person is entitled to a private life and deserves respect as a human being. So the CIA financed the publishing of the book and at the 1958 Brussels World Fair, CIA agents hung around and passed out copies to every Russian visitor. By circulating the book and these ideas inside the Soviet Union, they would undermine the legitimacy of the Soviet system with its own people. That was their goal, because they viewed the Cold War as a war of ideas. The CIA then leaned on the Nobel Prize Committee and suggested it should give Pasternak the Nobel Prize for literature. This was deeply concerning to the Soviet state, because they viewed it as a major propaganda blow against the Soviet system that a book they had refused to publish would be recognized in that way. This so-called soft power approach to subverting the USSR from within seemed fairly remarkable, mainly because the word humanistic is not in the CIA vernacular. Now, if you ask me, it was an attempt by the CIA to kill as many Russians as possible through sheer soul-crushing boredom, because Dr. Zhivago is a rambling, incoherent word glacier that no one absolutely no one has ever, ever finished. It's putting me to sleep even thinking about it. Nighty night. It follows the life of Yuri Zhivago, a Russian medic who spends a lot of time writing poetry that no one ever reads. He's married to a woman he can't love, and he loves a woman he can't have named Laura, who, whenever she appears, invokes zither music. But, sigh, heartbreak, Laura's in love with Turgidov, and Turgidov is in secretly in love with Anesthesia, and then Colonel Stodsky and Commander Mononotsky and General Boredom and Major Ennui decide that uh, Zhivago is some sort of a dissident, and they ban him to the Migraine Peninsula. Folks, any book that needs a flow chart to keep track of all the characters is in trouble. 592 pages long, spans 40 years. There are 61 suicides. At the end, there's a little blank where you can fill in your own name if you actually finished it. It's a brick, a tub of literary lard, a giant boiled cabbage of Cyrillic frippery written by an ink pen full of mercury. In the following year, it won the Nobel Prize for Literature. 
So Nikita Khrushchev informed Pasternak that were he to go to Sweden to accept the award, he could count on never seeing his beloved Russia again. Pasternak turned the award down, sank into a deep depression, and two years later he died, crushed to death by the weight of his own novel. Intelligence agents during the Cold War went to extraordinary lengths to extract information, any information, about what the Soviets were up to. Here's an example. In the early 60s, a black, unmarked CIA van pulled up to the curb right here on Wisconsin Avenue, across from the Russian embassy. And out of the van emerged a small cat with a tiny recording device implanted in his ear. The cat had been instructed by the CIA to stroll up to the Russian embassy, slip inside, and pad around eavesdropping on Soviet state matters. Sadly, the little fella got 10 feet across Wisconsin Avenue before he got flattened by a taxi. It took another four years for the CIA to abandon that project, and they spent nearly $20 million on it. This is the kind of stuff that gives government spending a bad name. Throughout the Cold War, the CIA remained eternally baffled by Russia's economic policy. They gnawed through pencils all day and tried to somehow compute Russia's net material growth into gross domestic product. But nothing these people had learned at Harvard or Georgetown applied to Soviet economics because Soviet economics wasn't based on profit. Soviets didn't obsess about the number at the end of a product. They obsessed about the number at every phase of the product. Extraction of raw material had a number. Processing that raw material had a number. Assembly, shipping, delivery. Every juncture was apprised and scrutinized and micromanaged so that at the end there would be one logical and absolute price to a product. Somebody somewhere would buy it. Money, money, money. Now, Americans love to tell each other that in Russia, even if you were lucky enough to afford a car, you still had to wait three years to get one. But to Russians, that was a source of pride. It was sure evidence that nothing was being wasted, and to have to raise the price of anything was an admission of failure. Money, money, honey, rock and roll. Break it in, mail it up like hay. Have a rockin' good time through it all the way. America learned early on in the Cold War that Russia's abiding fear of failure and humiliation was a powerful weapon to use against it. Take, for example, the Rocky and Bullwinkle show that ran from 1959 to 1964. It addressed the Cold War in terms of pure morality, good versus evil. It was a kid's cartoon secretly written for adults. Bullwinkle was a wall-eyed, well-meaning moose who represented the goodwill and decent intentions of all Americans. Rocky was a flying squirrel in fighter pilot gear, thus the embodiment of U.S. military superiority. Wow, Rich, you're really stretching this one, aren't you? Nonetheless, their arch-rivals were Natasha Fatale and Boris Badenov, dim-witted Stalinists who worked for someone named Mr. Big at the Kremlin. And at every turn, Boris and Natasha's attempts to undermine the decency of America were thwarted. No, we got lots of others. Yeah. I just threw overboard. Oh, Boris, why didn't you become violinist like Mama wanted? Humor at the expense of Russian ineptitude helped solidify America's sense of moral superiority. Because at a time when Soviet technology was outpacing the U.S., any Soviet own goal was a cause for celebration. Never was this more evident than when the crown prince of Russia's esteemed Kirov Ballet, Rudolf Nureyev, defected. In June of 1961, the Russian ministry sent the Kirov Ballet to Paris. The KGB had warned the Russian ministry that this was a bad idea, because Nureyev, he was, a, he was a loose cannon. He was aloof, he was arrogant, he was like the James Dean of the ballet world. But Khrushchev was determined to electrify the world with Soviet cultural supremacy. Nureyev immediately lived up to their fears by hitting all the gay bars in Paris and chatting up every stranger he met. 
Given Russia's ongoing attitude towards homosexuality, Rudolph probably had already made up his mind he wasn't going back. On June 16th, at the Le Bourget airport, while the rest of the troop boarded a plane back to Moscow, Nuriev turned, executed a perfect triple glissade to the feet of the French police, arose with an imboit, and announced he was defecting. Well, as you can imagine, this is a blow to Russia's pride and self-esteem. So a year later, Khrushchev puts missiles into Cuba. What? Okay, that's a bit revisionist. But uh, there's no question that Khrushchev's leadership was fraying. Okay, he, he put a man in space, he, he put a wall up in Berlin, you can put those in the wind column, but his beloved agricultural reforms were falling apart at the seams. 1960 was supposed to be the year that the Soviet economy caught up with America's. Instead, there's bread lines, and the world's largest manufacturer of wheat is actually importing it from other countries. He's surrounded by missiles, he's just lost his best dancer. What he needs is a wag the dog moment. Arm a country with missiles 90 miles off the U.S. coast, and trust me, the whole world will know you are a heavy hitter. So funny. Then I told old Khrushchev, sitting there looking bad, get that junk out of Cuba before you make me mad. This, of course, was a catastrophic disaster. The Cuban Missile Crisis has been covered ad nauseum on history channels, so here, in the interest of British viewers who love nothing better than a good long list of complaints and grievances, is a litany of Russian snafus that pushed us eyeball to eyeball with World War III. In October 1962, Kennedy had opted to blockade the Russian naval incursion that was bringing in four nuclear-armed Foxtrot subs from the Sea of Murmansk to the Caribbean. In fact, to avoid sounding too aggressive, Kennedy didn't even call it a blockade. He called it a quarantine, as if the U.S. was trying to contain an outbreak of measles. Well, the crew of the four Foxtrot submarines probably would have preferred measles to the genuine hell that they were put through. The 69th Torpedo Brigade, I think, was the unit of four submarines that was dispatched to Cuba. By the time they arrived in the Caribbean, they had very limited uh, communications with the Soviet Union. And in fact, they were starting to rely more upon what they could overhear on U.S. radio. Over the course of their mission, the conditions got pretty intense in the submarine, and they were eventually surrounded by a number of U.S. destroyers. The American Navy forced them to stay continuously submerged. The temperature reached 140 degrees Fahrenheit. The food rotted. There was no water to bathe with. They got ulcers, and the ointment that the Soviet doctors rubbed on them made them turn green. The captain of one of the Russian subs sent a man named Lieutenant Dubivko up on top to wave a Russian flag and find out if they were actually at war with the U.S. He was green, he was emaciated, he was wearing only underpants. So instead of forcing a surrender, the captain of the U.S. warship actually asked him if he needed help. And he said no, and he disappeared back down the hatch. And at one point, the commander was like, damn it, let's just open fire. We're probably already at war, and so load the nuclear torpedo. But by coincidence, they also happened to have the deputy commander of their submarine brigade on board as well. And so he was higher on the chain of command. It was this man, Vasily Arkhipov, who managed to talk down Savitsky and can persuade him that, no, we shouldn't do this yet. We should surface the submarine so our communications can work and get orders from Moscow before we do anything uh, rash. I think we came frighteningly close to nuclear war. So the USSR backed down and the sub-commanders returned to the Soviet Union where there was nothing waiting for them but scorn, humiliation, and fresh underpants. So in truth, the Soviets averted World War III, but there was no question in the aftermath in the eyes of the world that the USSR had been the aggressor and good old American democracy had prevailed. As for Khrushchev, he never really recovered from the USSR back down. And two years later, the Soviet Politburo presented him with a brand new TV and sent him packing.
The Cuban Missile Crisis left the free world feeling a little bit skittish about its ability to protect itself from a full-scale nuclear onslaught. So civil defense organizations tried to allay these fears with propaganda films, reassuring its citizens that its defense systems were well prepared. In Britain, the most popular film was Hole in the Ground. In America, it was The Power of Decision. Suffice it to say, neither of these films splurged on production values. At this moment, you're in the central part of the United States, over 100 feet below the surface of the Earth. Note the difference in tones. Britain is civil-minded. Everyone pitches in. America's attitude is, leave it to the military. We know what we're doing. 1440 hours on the 24th of January, 19. Well, the year doesn't really matter. This man in the warning and monitoring organization is a chief sector warning officer. These people normally work in the local post office. And as they knew all about telephones anyway, they, like the scientist, volunteered for this work. They trained at a special... There you go. Rest easy, Britain. You can sleep well knowing that girls who know all about phones are locked into oncoming nuclear chatter like Navajo wind talkers. One of the most reassuring parts of the film is the UK warning and monitoring organization showing off its incredibly sophisticated early warning system. This air attack message has been passed to the BBC for nationwide broadcast. No message received and understood. At the same time, an automatic system known as carrier control is relaying the message to 15,000 warning points throughout the country. Now it is only a matter of seconds before the nation knows it's fighting for survival. There is an emergency announcement. Okay, it looks a little ropey, but I'm pretty sure that was a special MOD engineered turntable that could withstand the impact of a nuclear bomb without skipping. Compare that to the USA's bravado and crisp efficiency. It is the most powerful military force in world history. To transmit decisions to the force, we have this... Wait a minute, that's the same red phone. Fire at will on designated targets. When America gets attacked, it's all guns blazing. When Britain gets attacked, the staff can do nothing more than await confirmation that the nuclear attack has begun. Indeed, neither of these films end well. Civilians die. But America's ultra-aggressive approach is going to be way more tragic. Sure. Catastrophic damage has been inflicted on the United States. Total personnel casualties are estimated to exceed 60 million. 60 million dead? And this film is supposed to calm people's fears about nuclear war. Meanwhile, in Britain, good old-fashioned fatalism and resignation pays off. What's it like on the south coast, sir? Well, not too bad at all. Only one burst. Southampton was the only place that got hit. Southampton? That's where our parents live. Well, what do we learn from that? That uh, in Britain, a megaton nuclear explosion and the resulting radioactive fallout is casually referred to as a burst, and that the total destruction of Southampton is best described as not bad. Now oh, let's do right, or oh, let's just say we're through. I just can't stand another cold, cold war with you. Now what these films failed to point out was that America had actually done a pretty good job of trying to blow itself up without the Soviets' help. On October the 5th, 1960, two years before the Cuban Missile Crisis, the duty commander for NORAD, the North American Missile Defense Command, was showing off his new early warning missile system to some businessmen from IBM and Bell and & Howell. He was letting them sit in the big chair and pretend to oversee America's missile arsenal. All of a sudden, the number one flashed up on the screen, which meant unidentified objects were heading for the United States. And in no time at all, that level had gone to five, meaning a 99.5% chance a Russian nuclear attack was underway. Five. Red alert. Scramble interceptors for attack on enemy missile. At this time, the standard integrated operating procedure for level five 
was to transmit an irreversible go code to all armed U.S. bombers to retaliate and unload everything they had on Russia. The president and various civilian leaders were then expected to run into underground bunkers and ride it out, then come back out and rebuild whatever remained of the country. Now, this was all happening in minutes. The duty commander was just about to issue the go code, as in boom, when all of a sudden, a very dapper three-star Canadian general named C. Roy Slimmon, clearly the most astute man in the room, pointed out that Khrushchev happened to be in New York City that very day, visiting the United Nations. And the Soviets weren't idiotic enough to blow up a country whose leader was standing in the middle of. So he overrode the built-in order, told the planes to stand down. Everyone held their breath, hoping old C. Roy was right. And the missiles never came. Turns out that the BMEWS, the early warning system in Thule, Greenland, had mistaken, and wait for it, this is impossibly romantic, moon echoes over Norway for incoming missiles. I'm with the TV. That's right, World War III almost yeah, broke out on October 5th, 1960, because of something that sounds like a Waterboy song. Fortunately, the cooler head of C. Roy Slimmon prevailed. Bomb, bomb, hydrogen bomb. Yeah. Bomb, bomb, hydrogen bomb. It's a big loud noise in your ear gone. Bomb, bomb, the hydrogen bomb. Now this is just one of the dozens of close calls and near misses in America's nuclear follies. In the late 50s and the early 60s, the U.S. Air Force developed a habit of accidentally dropping nuclear bombs onto the southern United States. An atomic bomb breaks loose from a mounting shackle in a B-47 jet over Florence, South Carolina. Plummets to Earth, causing a sensational freak accident. In January of 1961, a U.S. Air Force B-52 passed over Goldsboro, North Carolina on what was called a coverall mission. That's when a plane flies for 24 hours with two thermonuclear weapons locked and loaded. While attempting a mid-air refueling, the B-52 sprung a massive leak. It lost 19 tons of fuel within two minutes, then the right wing snapped off. Six of the eight crewmen ejected before the fuselage snapped in half, and two armed bombs flipped out, just like malt teasers out of a loose bag. The specific target was Big Daddy Road, small hamlet right outside of Faro, North Carolina. We went to bed about 12 o'clock, and my understanding, it failed about 12.35, and it didn't wake me up, but my brother, next door neighbor, woke him up, and he came over there and said he thought they were bombing Seymour Johnson Field. One of the bombs parachuted into a tree, and the other landed in a farmer's field, and when it hit, locals were convinced it was the end of the world. We were just standing there, and then a man from Seymour Johnson Field got up on the truck and said, folks, for God's sakes, get away from here. And by that time, some of the fuel caught a fire and it went all up in the air and he didn't have to say it again. We all left. Both bombs had passed through five of the six steps required to detonate them. The only thing that prevented an explosion 250 times greater than Hiroshima was a low voltage arming switch. In layman's terms, on off. Now the bomb that they found in the tree had a switch turned to off. The other bomb landed in a waterlogged field. It took the Army Corps of Engineers five days to dig the core out. They told locals they were looking for an ejector seat. When they finally found the arming switch, it was switched to on. Now to this day, there are major disagreements between the Air Force and subsequent investigators as to how that bomb didn't go off. The predominantly Baptist residents of the local area took a more ecclesiastical view. God had created the world in six consecutive stages. He could destroy it in six consecutive stages. But he so loved the people of Big Daddy Road that he manually overrode that bomb. Church attendance at the Pharaoh Baptist Church tripled over the next year. Everybody's worried oh, about that atomic bomb. Oh, but no one has seen worry about the day my Lord shall come. Oh, He's gonna hit oh, like an atom bomb oh, when he come, when he come. Oh, 
Now, maybe you're thinking, if the U.S. with its stringent fail-safe systems could screw up this badly, what about the Soviets, where life was cheap and health and safety merely a suggestion? The Kishkim disaster in September 1957 in Russia's Ural Mountains may well rank as the worst and most senseless nuclear accident in history. You're never going to see a TV series made about it because no official records of the accident actually exist. But in June 1958, a small article appeared in a magazine called Cosmic Voice, a journal devoted to extraterrestrial pursuits. Its editor, George King, no relation to Mackenzie King, claimed that he had been telepathically alerted to an atomic accident in Russia by someone from Sector 6 of Mars. The Martian claimed that huge amounts of strontium-90 and radioactive nitrogen had been released into the Earth's atmosphere. And to add credibility to this story, King received a similar statement several days later from someone on Venus. Oddly, no major news outlet of the day picked up on the story. 22 years later, articles started appearing in science magazines and newspapers about the accident. In its haste to build a plutonium bomb, Russian workers had skimped on certain essential safety standards, namely storing nuclear waste. They just dumped it into the Tekka River, the main source of drinking water for the 24 villages along its banks. Later, they decided to build some crude storage tanks built on a concrete slab. Water pipes ran around the tanks to keep the waste cool. Well, wouldn't you know it, in the harsh Siberian weather of minus 40 degrees, the water pipes burst. The waste heated up to 660 degrees Fahrenheit, and one day in late September of 1957, the world's first dirty bomb went off, contaminating everything within a 180 square mile radius. The authorities tried to convince the local population it was the Northern Lights. Now, no one reported the accident because MIAC was a top secret project and technically didn't exist. It took another two years to evacuate the residents of the 24 villages. They burnt down their houses so that they couldn't loot them and spread the radioactivity. Then they sealed the whole area off and renamed it the East Urals Nature Reserve. The United States had developed its own terminology for these sort of incidents. The Kishtim disaster was known as a bent spear. A lost nuclear bomb was a broken arrow. There were empty quivers and dull swords, generally implying that any nuclear accident was the fault of Native Americans. What can you do? People screw up. Things go wrong. Sometimes human error leads to amazing discoveries. Take, for example, the Russian scientist Anatoly Bogorsky, who in 1978 accidentally stuck his head in the path of a particle accelerator beam. Astoundingly, not only did Bogorsky survive, half of his face never aged another day. A discovery that's never really been optimized by the cosmetic surgery industry. But ladies, the miracle is out there. If half of you wants to look young forever, pop your head in a particle accelerator beam. Exploding. Nuclear bombs killed relatively few people in the Cold War, but what killed hundreds of thousands was the thing the bombs were designed for. The fight against communism, the American belief that it could pursue this ideology on a neutral stage using conventional warfare turned into a disaster, Vietnam. All the nukes in the world hadn't changed a thing about real combat. Men were still dying on the ground. I'm sitting here just contemplating. And a nation with nuclear superiority couldn't even seem to be able to win a war against a third division country. This split the USA along cultural lines. There were those who championed it and those who thought it was the world's death sentence. And you know a situation is critical when folk singers start weighing in. Barry Maguire's Eve of Destruction was a million-selling piece of 60s pop apocalypse. Don't believe we're on the eve of destruction. 
So gung-ho right-wingers countered with the Ballad of the Green Beret by Sergeant Barry Sadler, basically a recruiting pit set to music. Fighting soldiers from the sky. What America seemed to want was reassurance of its superiority without actually having to confront the grim realities. So it turned non-military disciplines, basketball courts, ice rinks, boxing rings, even chessboards into ideological slugfests. Of the Green Beret. The world's news media were ravenous for their first sight of the American chess player actually stepping onto Icelandic soil. It's hard to imagine that two men crowding a chessboard could manifest itself as an international clash of ideologies, but the 1972 match between the Russian Grandmaster Boris Spassky and American weirdo Bobby Fischer did exactly that. Fisher himself called the match nothing less than the free world against the lying, cheating, hypocritical Russians. Basically what they were doing was uh, you know, drawing among themselves and playing hard to beat me. So they were, when they played me, they had uh, one or two days of rest because they were playing among, you know, with each other and making quick draws. When they played me, they were fresh. For Russians, the game of chess was almost reverential. It was one of the few unsanctioned areas of intellectual freedom, and it was proof of Soviet intellectual superiority. So a lot was at stake when those two men sat down in Reykjavik, Iceland in July 1972. And given that the idea of watching two men play chess is just about the most mind-numbing, tedious thing you can imagine, we've replaced that footage with this. In game one, Fisher gets off to a horrible start. His Nimzo Indian defense is helpless against Spassky's relentless pummeling of his knight's position. Spassky's bishop to h2 seals the round. Game two, equally disastrous. Fisher doesn't even bother to show up. But by game three, Fisher comes to life. Switches to the modern Benoni defense. Oh my god, rook to b3. That was from downtown, baby. Follows by bishop to d4. Nothing but ivory. On they go, trading pawns. Match 21, Spassky switches to the Sicilian defense. Paulson variation. Spassky's on the ropes. Fisher delivers a shuddering king to G4, checkmate! Well, Americans managed to dine out on that for about a month. But then came the Olympics. Most people remember the 1972 Olympics in Munich as the site of the massacre of 11 Israeli athletes by the Palestinian terrorist group Black September. Despite protests, the games go on as Israel buries her dead and the world mourns the innocent victims of the Munich massacre. But most Americans remember it for the men's basketball final. The two strongest countries in the world faced each other on a hardwood court for the gold medal and world supremacy. This was the 50th anniversary of the, uh, the formation of the Soviet Union. Uh, and the Russian team's goal was to win 50 gold medals to sort of celebrate that and commemorate that. And the basketball final was the last chance for them to win their 50th gold medal of the Olympics. As it turned out, the Soviets took a 10-point lead with, uh, with about 10 minutes to play in the game, as I recall, and the Americans fought back. With three seconds left and the USA trailing by a point, an American player, Doug Collins, stood at the free throw line. And this could well be the winning shot. Such pressure on a young man. And it's there. There were three seconds still on the clock when the Soviets inbounded the ball, but even as they began play, their coaches and subs ran onto the floor. They claimed they had signaled for a timeout when Collins was at the line, which is patently illegal. You can't call a timeout if you're not in possession of the ball. The Olympic basketball's top executive, a Brit named R. William Jones, stormed down from the stands and ordered that the clock be reset to three seconds and the Soviets given another chance to get it right. The Soviets inbounded the ball. This time they managed only a long, wild shot. And again, the Americans seemed to have won the game. Jubilant fans stormed the court. But because the clock hadn't been reset correctly to three seconds, Jones ordered yet another replay. And on their third attempt, the Soviets scored to win the game 51 to 50. And oh my goodness, I don't believe it. They had won their 50th gold medal of the 1972 Olympics in extraordinary circumstances. The American players obviously were devastated. You know, they thought they had won in regulation. They refused to come out for the medal ceremony. The Americans never accepted their silver medals. They are locked up in a vault in Switzerland, and they may stay there. 
The bitterness of losing to the Soviets festered in America's memory. But fortunately, eight years later in Lake Placid, New York, it was finally vindicated. A crunch for Pakistan in play. The U.S. men's ice hockey team, composed entirely of amateurs and students, beat the Soviets, all professional players, three to two. The so-called miracle on ice is generally considered the greatest moment in American sports history and a defining moment in the Cold War. Nuclear paralysis turned events like these into proxy Cold War battles, which frankly was refreshing considering nobody was getting blown up. The Cold War became an exercise in escalation avoidance. Minimize confrontation, give the other side a little room to breathe. Kind of like chess. Exactly like chess. Secret agent man, secret agent man. And that game of chess still goes on to this day, with spies being exchanged like pawns. After the Salisbury poisoning incident, the free democracies of the world and Russia began this series of kind of tit for tat spy expulsions. For instance, the U.S. expelled 60 Russian spies, Russia expelled 60 U.S. spies, so on and so forth. This is according to news reports. And the news reports never ever said suspected spies or accused spies. It just said spies. Surely the first rule of being a spy is no one knows you're a spy. The idea of the suave, sophisticated, gentlemanly spy is not only a British invention, it's probably Britain's biggest cultural export. Of all of the Cold War influences on culture, on books, on film, on television, the spy caper is the most exciting. Which is crazy, because actually spying is the most boring aspect of the Cold War. These are real spies. Try picturing any of them in a tuxedo, driving around in an invisible car. People lap up spy adventures because it's the manufactured face of intelligence gathering. It's the domain of Tom Clancy and Lynn Dayton and all those other purveyors of spy porn consumed by sad men on airplanes. No one knew this better than Ian Fleming. He took the banal process of intelligence gathering and spun it into gold. Finger. For 50-something years now, British cinema has been cranking out the same wildly implausible misadventures of some tuxedo popinjay called 007, a man with no recriminations about the fact that he spends his entire adult life preying on traumatized women whose parents thought it'd be hilarious to name them Pussy Galore, Honey Rider, Holly Goodhead, then send them out in the world to see how they got on. But wait a minute, Rich. How many times has 007 kept some evil tyrant from taking over the world? Yes, they are evil tyrants. You know what else they are? Disabled. Dr. No has no hands. Stromberg has webbed fingers. That's a condition known as Apert syndrome. Jaws is afflicted with some kind of insane orthodontia that resembles outside scaffolding. Look, these guys may live in a volcanic bunker, but technically they are entitled to full health care and free parking. And Bond just kicks the crap out of it. Here's the problem with intelligence gathering. It's just an extraction of fact. It can't detect the, the, the true intent, the passions, the prejudices, the preconceptions of people in charge. You could spy on Trump 24-7. You could embed some kind of monofilament hair fiber optic into that desiccated patch of shredded Weetabix sitting on his head. Record his every word in action. You still wouldn't know what the hell he was going to do next. Soviet intelligence could not uncover the true motivation of America's political and military leaders because America's political and military leaders are boneheaded, grandiose, obtuse, dullards. And America couldn't predict what Russia's intentions were because the average Russian plutocrat's motivation was not to get shot. Just like those warheads, intelligence created its own stalemate. Watch out. You might get what you're after. 
As the Cold War entered the 80s, the stalemate was starting to thaw. Ronald Reagan was elected president in November 1980 and saw off three hardline Soviet leaders. Then in 1985, a guy came along who Reagan could do some business with, Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev would eventually loosen the Soviet grip on the Iron Curtain through his policies of glasnost and perestroika. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Now, Reaganites and historians love to tell you that Reagan beat communism, but if anything beat communism, it was communism itself, with the help of Harrison Ford and George Lucas. Fanning into space, a layered defense to protect the country from nuclear devastation. In 1983, Reagan announced his plans for the Strategic Defense Initiative, better known as Star Wars. A crazy science fiction umbrella of radars, space lasers, missiles, and death beams that would ward off all Soviet missiles, not from below, but from above. It did seem like a pretty phantasmagorical approach that we were going to be putting up these defenses in the sky that would hit missiles if once they were launched and could just protect us. It became a serious element in the negotiations between the two superpowers. The president uh, used it as a bargaining chip. I think the, the Soviets were pretty terrified of it. The most expensive technological undertaking ever was named after the second highest grossing film in history. And the Ruskies had to back away from the poker table. Quite simply, they couldn't match the stakes. They were broke. The decline of the communist ideology and the failure of the Soviet economy eventually ended the USSR. And it was the collapse of the Berlin Wall on November 9, 1989, that eventually ended the Cold War. Then, just before 10 o'clock, the moment Berliners have waited 28 years for. A symbolic breach in the structure that separated millions and claimed hundreds of lives. Who won the Cold War? Nobody. They just flipped ideologies. America has become a country that's become accustomed to its leader lying, and even accepts that maybe lying on an industrial scale is actually good for industry. The current government rules by fear and intimidation. The people who staff that government are apparatchiks whose main concern is to appease the leader, not the people. Sound familiar? The Soviets, on the other hand, saw capitalism as lawless and immoral, then embraced capitalism and became the most lawless and immoral place on the planet. Nowadays, it's basically a gas station with a bunch of rusty nukes out back. So it proved its point. I think the relationship with Russia has gotten ever more complicated. Um, there are sanctions that Russia would like to have lifted, that Trump would like to lift, but there's still enough suspicion of Trump's motives and enough anti-Russian attitudes in the Congress that I don't think he can get away with that. I think most of the American people feel that the Russians uh, meddled with our election, uh, probably got Donald Trump elected and Hillary Clinton defeated. At one level, you have the American president who seems interested in improving the relationship. So we should be in a state of very good relations, but the fact is we're not. I now am very suspicious about America. Because when America say that we are the best, our values are the best, and we have to really promote those values all around the world, I feel a little smell <laughs> of my childhood uh, and youth in the USSR. No one could beat communism because it's mutant and amorphous. You know, like those uh, stupid Terminator films they keep making. It was always living in the future, in striving mode, just one five-year plan away from fulfillment. So nowadays, unless you want to count the totalitarian Disneyland that is North Korea, it's gone. 
but the missiles are still there, locked and loaded, waiting for the same electrical impulse that you used to send a text on a phone. And the only thing that keeps them there is the sheer denial that we would use them in the first place. Yeah, we could use some music and some credits right here. More in our Cold War season on Thursday with the tit-for-tat propaganda war between the East German Stasi and the BBC. London calling Cold War letters at eight. And stay with us next for Peter Sellers in Dr. Strangelove.